The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we had a big lecture last time on perfect insurance uh, and implications for uh, targeting and policy uh, and evaluations. There's a series of lectures now that have to do with uh, working off of that basic risk-sharing framework. Today we're going to talk about the implications for what we should see in rates of return. And then next class we're going to talk about uh, alternative models of, uh, of what we might see in the consumption data. Uh, and then the lecture after that, we're going to return to the perfect market model and think about labor supply. And then finally, we're going to get to explicit obstacles to trade. I must say that you know, rather than put off the obstacles, we've been noting and even talking about alternative models along the way. Uh, because these benchmarks are sometimes rejected. And you're going to see that a bit today as well. Uh, so this perfect market standard within villages that has to do with uh, relatives and friends interacting with each other has implications for how you adjust for risk. And we're going to do that with a vengeance. But it will turn out that it does that framework allows us to distinguish aggregate from idiosyncratic risk. And uh, in the idiosyncratic risk should not be showing up in rates of return, but it does at the end. Um, and then I'll say a few words about what else we know about the Thai data in terms of the decomposition of volatility, uh, linking back to a paper we saw the very first lecture. Uh, on quantifying the growth rates by sector, uh, but we're going to do it by wealth. At least I'll say a few words about it. Uh, and then I'm going to, toward the end of the class, sort of uh, return to this idea that either things aren't perfect and or people are making mistakes. And we'll do that in some uh, unusual context one that has to do with data from Sweden, an unusually rich database from Sweden, and another that has to do with the US airlines. Uh, but the basic frameworks that are getting used, whether in the developing context or Sweden or uh, US airlines, are basically all the same. So there's a strong complementarity across these papers. This paper with Chris um, has been in the works for a while, but we are now able to use, you know, 13 years of monthly data, so we are doing better than, than before. Um, so we want to talk about risk and return of productive assets in developing countries. Uh, we already looked at some of the slides showing how rates of return differ a, a lot across different households, differ in large part by wealth and how poor people have relatively high rates of return and they're saving and they, you know, they're accumulating assets and so on. Um, another, people, another way people look at rates of return is to say, you know, well, some people are more talented than others. Uh, so, you know, if we look at rates of return, we get some some notion of underlying productivity, as in TFP, and so on. We've had many lectures about TFP and coefficients in front multiplying in front of production functions and so on. But correct me if I'm wrong, nowhere in any of that stuff did we ever adjust for risk. So what's the intuition for adjusting for risk? Well, if you want to look at 
you know, compensating differentials, the higher the risk of a project, the higher the rate of return ought to be other things equal to compensate for that risk. You know, like junk bonds have higher yields and so on and so forth. So maybe these guys with seemingly very high rates of return actually are just doing risky things. And indeed, if enough of them do risky things, then on average some of them succeed and maybe that would generate the high rate of return. So we really need to think about how to measure the risk. And we're going to rely on finance theory, but we're I'll be very careful to sort of build into it the economic models. You may learn a little bit of finance jargon along the way, uh, but I'm not going to start with that. Um, I'll, I'll get you up to speed. Uh, it's really not that hard when you look at the equations. Okay, so what do we find? Um, we do find uh, that higher risk is associated with higher rate of return, but, but the risk that we're going to be concentrating on in the model is not idiosyncratic risk. It's village level risk. So when you think about households together pooling resources as in a risk sharing syndicate, uh, they would care about, say, aggregate consumption should move individual consumption and idiosyncratic income shock should not have an influence on consumption. So when is something really valuable? It's uh, a, a project is valuable when it has a return which is negatively correlated with the village average return, you know, so that the resources come in when you need it. So the, quote, market the way the finance guys would use it, for us is the village. Uh, and indeed, the more a household has a return on its projects that are correlated with the village average return, the higher is going to be the measured expected or average return on that household's assets. And we have all kinds of ways of adjusting for human capital and, uh, and so on, which I'll get into. As I said, though, it does, in the end, leave some idi uh, idiosyncratic risk, and that's also generating higher expected returns. Um, aggregate and idiosyncratic risk is negatively correlated with age. So the older a household head, basically, the, uh, quote, less risky things that they're doing. But, but both in the idiosyncratic and aggregate sense, they tend to do things which are l less correlated with the village average. Um, it's negative with wealth, meaning um, the lower is wealth, the higher both the idiosyncratic and aggregate. Now, this, so this gets us into poor people and how exposed are they to risk. We've seen a bit of that already in risk and return in Village India, that there are some landless laborers and labor income that tends to move consumption around more. This is a bit different way of measuring it in the sense that we're not going to look so much at the consumption data. We're going to assume everyone is in this risk sharing syndicate, but we turn around and see what is reflected in in rates of return. And in particular, relatively poor people are more exposed to, to risk, but it's not just their own idiosyncratic risk, it's the, it's the aggregate risk. Um, and uh, there is a little bit of role for education, but it's kind of problematic, and there's some selection bias that I might talk about when we get there. Uh, and, then, and then this is uh, maybe the punchline. Uh, if you want to think about talent, then you want to adjust for all sources of risk. 
And when we do that, we find who are seemingly the really productive people in the village. And all of a sudden, it's the higher wealth people who have the higher risk adjusted rate of return and female headed households. So relatively wealthy females actually dominate in terms of get, getting a higher rate of return. So we have a basic model. Uh, they're going to be J households uh, and L production activities. Each activity uses, utilizes capital as an input. And let's simplify and say all these technologies produce the same thing, consumption goods, and we'll simplify further and assume all the technologies are linear. Yeah, Matt. Can I just ask a couple of things about the previous slide? So um, are we assuming that, first thing is, are we assuming there's no, we assume there's no risk sharing between villages? So we are, again, going to take uh, a stand on our baseline, and it's actually going to be all four villages in a province, not just a single village. But then we go back and check for villages individually, and we actually go back further and look one network at a time. Okay. The basic results don't change. Okay. Um, another thing which um, I don't really understand is um, when, we, uh, when we have this result that the returns, the risk adjusted returns are lower for those with lower initial wealth, how do we think of that in terms of, you know, one story is that the people with low initial wealth, there are very productive people amongst them, but they're unable to you know, get to the efficient size of their business. So their ma marginal returns might be very, really high, um, and their average returns as well, depending on the Yeah, so this paper isn't going to help much with that, because we're going to assume linear technologies and margins are going to be equal to averages. Uh, and, and in more generally, you know, wealth is clearly an endogenous variable. So we're not saying, you know, high wealth is causing people to have right. I mean, it's more likely the other way around. But yeah, we've gone through a series of models where wealth helps overcome constraints. The first four lectures were like that. Um, so in a way, this is another fact-finding mission, but it's not just data summaries. It's looking at the data through the lens of the model, and you have to make some assumptions to, to do that. Um, OK. So we have J production activities. Uh, we're going to start the economy off with some aggregate wealth, W. And, and those are basically the projects, the assets, or the trees, if you like. And, uh, and those projects are going to have rates of return, the fruit. Uh, so at the beginning of the period, the, the total sort of wealth available is the sum of the, the trees and the fruit. So this is a standard kind of solo reversible capital assumption that the assets can basically be, be sold. There's no irreversibility. You can convert them into consumption if you choose to. Uh, so we're going to have a social planner sort of directing the show, uh, which is not to say this might not decentralize in some way. That said, I want to emphasize it's not like finance in the sense that people participate on the you know, New York Stock Exchange or the financial markets and they're buying and selling stocks. We don't even have the data of all these capital goods. That's not the mechanism. Uh, this planner's problem may be decentralized in some way, but it's just much more straightforward, just like when we did the risk sharing stuff, not to necessarily be forced into you know, some interpretation. We're just going to solve the planning problem directly. So somehow or other, a household is assigned, household J is assigned capital and is operating project type I, and this is the net rate of return. Notice that we allow individuals to vary in their rates of return. The planner could take advantage of it if it knows that some people are better than other people at doing things. So we're not just getting rid of talent. We're embedding it at some level in these rates of return. And then they, you know, they have the basically um, the tree and the 
and the, and the fruit, that's their starting point, and then they get taxes and transfers, these taus. I mean, here it's written positive as, it's, as if it's incoming and adds to the resources of the household, but in fact, the planner, you know, like a risk sharing group, you can give and get and contribute to, to the social fund. So the planning problem is to maximize discounted, weighted, expected utilities. So these, these lambda J weights are the Pareto weights for households type J. They're not necessarily the same over all the households. And this whole term here is the utility function, which as noted is just the return on the trees, you know, plus, um, plus these transfers. Um, and then discounted uh, expected return for tomorrow, um, the, I usually write it as beta, but anyway, it's, it's an intertemporal discount rate. Uh, and so you have the value function today, given wealth today, and expected value of wealth tomorrow, W prime. And, you know, wealth today can be allocated into basically consumption. So this is just summing over not only over all projects for household J, but all households J. So this is again just consumption. So consumption plus capital allocated tomorrow equals total wealth. Pretty standard kind of growth market structure. Uh, <coughs> and you know what is total wealth of the economy? It's basically not only the fruit of the trees, but the trees themselves. Um, so you can take this expression and put it on the right-hand side if you want. Okay, so they have pre-existing capital. They have the rate of return on that. You've got total resources available. You can allocate it to consumption or set some aside to continue the capital stock for tomorrow. Uh, and so we just substitute in the expressions for, uh, you know, tomorrow's wealth and, uh, and today's wealth, for that matter. Uh, and then this odd-looking thing here is just a substitution from the previous equation, but there's a, a common term on both sides. It looks, that's why it looks kind of weird, because there's a, this is really, you know, 1 plus r times k over here. But there's also a 1 plus r times k here, and the r, k things are, are canceling out. So this, this is uh, just straightforward algebra. So we're going to maximize this thing by choosing the transfers tau j and the assignments of tomorrow's capital stock. Yeah. Yeah, there's no preference shocks here or What's the process? Like, what's the process for us? don't have to specify yet. Okay. That's probably a good thing. Okay. So so if you looked, uh, we've actually seen this before, but it, it's explicit here again. Uh, consumption and capital are interrelated through this resource constraint. So when you take a derivative to maximize with respect to the transfers, you know, you'll pick up a derivative in the utility function. And, uh, you know, the sum of total transfers is down here in the resource constraint, and there's a Lagrange multiplier in front of it, right? So you're going to get margin weighted, margin of utility to, of consumption today equal to a Lagrange multiplier. And when you differentiate with respect to the choice of tomorrow's capital stock, K prime, well, that's going to enter in tomorrow's value, so you'll have a derivative of the value function, and then internally this sort of rate of return. And, you know, that's also entering, this prime thing is also entering into the, the same resource constraint, so you're going to get the same Lagrange multiplier uh, as on consumption. And the, so here's a summary of you know, those words. Weighted margin utilities are equated across all the households to a common contemporaneous Lagrange multiplier. And then this is kind of a, 
it's an exactly Euler equation for capital accumulation. You know, this is the, the price of capital today. It's how much consumption you're giving up, and this is the expected discounted value of having uh, capital tomorrow. It's the derivative of the value function times the rate of return, depending on which project I and J is being chosen. Note that this is for every project, uh, every capital stock of type I for household J. Now, so far I've talked about real assets, but uh, it's not too hard, and we do actually allow external borrowing. You could imagine a village is able to borrow and lend, or the whole set of four villages have some relationship with the rest of the external economy. That still leaves this sub-problem. Uh, I mean, throwing these things in might deliver some extra conditions that we're ignoring, but what we're doing is not inconsistent with having this equation. All right, so if you just take this one and divide both sides through by mu, you get this. Um, and then you take the expectation operator in front of everything, including mu, even though it's not <coughs> random from the point of date t. And then you can rewrite uh, this guy here as something called m, or m prime, since in effect it's for tomorrow. And this r prime ij is basically, uh, you know, capital R is little r, 1 plus little r, sort of the gross rate of return. Okay. So this is hopefully not mysterious. It's just basically a, a relabeling of variables, and it's like the Euler equation. But if you want to impress your friends and bewilder your enemies, you call this thing the stochastic discount factor. <laughs> but all, all it is is the way society as a whole is discounting the future. It's tomorrow's sort of shadow price of resources relative to today's. So you're discounting tomorrow. And it's random because these rates of return are random, and so the amount of resources available in the economy is likely random, so it's stochastic. There's a danger in talking to someone about stochastic discount factors because you know you're gonna the conversation will keep going <laughs> and you may learn more or get bewildered. But anyway, as promised, we'll keep track of this. Um, so it's true for all households, all sectors, and the finance jargon is we just looked at something called the pricing equation in the consumption-based asset pricing world. But for us, it's just an Euler equation, you know, holding at, say, the village or let's call it township level. Uh, another thing you may or may not know or remember from finance is you can take assets and bundle them. Right? So you can have a particular asset held by a particular household, a project, or you could take a collection of assets. You know, that, that Euler equation has to hold for any asset individually and all assets collectively. You can bundle, package, rebundle any way you want, and anything that's actually held. By the way, there's another, there's sort of out of equilibrium projects we're not seeing they wouldn't satisfy the Euler equation. You know, they, they, they have a low rate of return relative to the other ones. So we're only seeing these equilibrium ones that the households actually hold. And of course, we're looking at the data at what they, they actually hold. I'm mentioning this bundling because, and you'll see it again, but we might as well get our minds around it here. We are going to look at a household's rate of return. And typical households, as you know, you've already seen this, are doing more than one thing. They, you know, some of the incoming money is from labor supply. 
they have crops, maybe multiple crops. Some of them have both that and a business and so on. Uh, we try very hard to assign these assets individually to particular activities, but it's kind of treacherous and we're likely to make mistakes. What do you do with a pickup truck, for example? Is that just used in farming or, you know, they're going to the bank, they're taking the kids to school? And uh, so rather than face all of that, we just aggregate up over all the activities any particular household is doing and call that a collection of assets and the Euler equation should apply. Now you remember a little bit of your sort of econometrics with means and variances, you know, the, uh, or mis easy mistakes to make. The expectation of two random variables is not just the product of the expectations. You, you, uh, you've got to adjust for the covariance, unless this happens to be zero. But this covariance is going to be crucial for us, because you can see already it's the covariance between, dare I say it, the stochastic discount factor, which you know, reflects the community's relative valuation of resources, and the particular return that uh, on project I held by household J. So, you know, since uh, we already had this equal to one as the Euler equation, right? So now we just sort of substitute this stuff into here and we get this. And now you could basically divide through by the expectation of M prime. Uh, you're going to get one over that here, get rid of it here, get the covariance divided by it here. And then you divide and multiply, which doesn't do any harm, by the variance of M prime and rearrange terms. So you get, you get this thing. You know, so we're finally arriving at something close to what we want, which is the, the expected rate of return, which is going to be in the data the average return for household J over all the time periods, well, not quite, is you know, it sort of looks like a linear function, something with an intercept, and then beta lambda. Beta, and finance guys talk about betas all the time, beta for us just means sort of the normalized covariance between the returns on ij and the stochastic discount factor, which I already pointed to above, okay? It's normalized by the overall variance. So that's kind of the risk factor or the quantity of risk. And this other thing could be called the price of risk, uh, but it's nothing other than this. It's the variance divided by the mean. Um, it almost looks like a coefficient of variation. <coughs> you know, like sigma squared divided by mu or something. Uh, and that, there's a name for it. I'll, I'll tell you what it is in a second. Um, all right, so this is what I said already. Quantities, prices. Uh, oh, and one more thing. What was that intercept? Uh, well, basically, Let's just define this thing, this gamma, well, was already defined to be 1 over the expectation of M prime. But let's call it the risk-free return. First of all, why is there no risk? Because all the var variability in the economy is in M prime, or the one that we care about for that equation. And we've already taken the expectation. So there's nothing random left. So this is a number. It's not something stochastic. It should be obvious, but I always do it myself, which is take that to be an asset, plug that back into the asset Euler equation that we already have, and just convince yourself you'll, that that equation applies for the risk-free return, and, you'll, and you will get, you'll get this right back again. Okay. Um, so anyway, the point is risk-free because 
the covariance of this risk-free rate with M prime is zero by construction. So, uh, so that just, let's just look at this again. This is the rate of return of the, the mean or average rate of return on project IJ. Subtract off the risk-free rate, this is the return differential. This is how much the, you know, in finance, it would be like the junk bond premium, <coughs> right, over and above treasuries. He, and so that, that difference is sort of the uh, premium that, that you get for holding a risky asset, and it's linearly related to uh, the covariance of that asset with the market. So again, I'm going back and forth a bit more with this finance language, but it's just all right off the Euler equation. This is just standard uh, sort of manipulation. So we can even make it more obvious if you're wondering what M prime really is. Uh, let's go with quadratic utility. Okay, so this is the form of it. The, community's value function as a function of wealth is just basically the squared of the difference between wealth and some subsistence level, okay, with a coefficient in front of it. So, of course, if you take the derivative of it with respect to W, uh, you know, the twos cancel out and you get eta times this difference, which is linear, by the way, that's huge, so marginal value of wealth is linear in wealth. That's what you get out of quadratic. And then you just substitute our expression for W prime tomorrow into that expression um, and do a little relabeling. So all of a sudden this looks like the return on the village average and the village average capital stock. Uh, okay, the village average capital stock is the sum of the capital stocks allocated over all the projects and all the households, as it should be to be in total, right? And then what is the rate of return on it? Well, basically it's like a capital weighted return. So, you know, the total return is coming from a bunch of individual projects, so you just take the return on all the individual projects that weight them by the capital being allocated to those projects and renormalize by the total capital stock. So it's a portfolio weighted return. That's just a definition. But of course, then it looks like this, and you take this up here and this here, and you realize that there's things canceling, and that's why it's really just equal to this. So. But we'll, we'll use this now. Uh, so M prime, which is the derivative tomorrow, is just this thing uh, divided by mu. Remember, we have to take the current shadow price and divide through. And then by, you know, this is all additive and linear. So um, So we get this. And now, M prime here looks like this plus this. This looks like a constant term that doesn't depend on the rate of return. And, uh, and this is a coefficient pre-multiplying the rate of return. So it's starting to look like uh, a, a pretty convenient equation for the stochastic discount factor. It's linear linear in the village rate of return. And again, we have this thing we already derived, which was, you know, a manipulation of the Euler equation. And everywhere you see 
m prime, you start substituting a minus b r m prime. And then you've got to remember certain rules about, you know, covariance operators and variance operators. You know, variance operators will square coefficients in front of them. Covariance operators will bring the coefficient outside. There's a lot of substitutions here. And the b, there's b's and b squares, and they're going to cancel with each other, and you end up with this thing. So this says the expected return or sample average return should just be um, uh, the covariance of the return with the market with the village average aggregate. By the way, we know how to construct that because we have it in the data. And we have the variance as well. And then this is just the sort of coefficient that multiplies it. Uh, that's what I was saying about that coefficient of variation. You know, it's a variance divided by a mean. Uh, so where we ended up, uh, well, with that quadratic, we now have pretty much an exact expression that the expected rate of return on project I run by household J should just be a linear function with a, a constant, a common constant term that has nothing to do with I and J. And then uh, the covariance of that household's return with the village average return, which is something we can compute. So you start thinking about this like a regression, you know, we're going to We'll know this from the data. We'll know this from the data. I'll tell you how to get it in a minute. And we'll just estimate lambda and gamma. Well, not quite. Gamma we can do something special with, but that's the idea. So I've said this already, but it bears repeating. Uh, our stuff looks a lot like this cap M, but the mechanism is very different. We do not have households trading assets that are priced in centralized markets. We're instead optimally allocating assets across households, but then not forcing them to eat the return stream. Instead, they enter into this risk syndicate as if a social planner were reallocating consumption. Whereas in finance, you kind of assume you're an investor, you know, you could do means and variances and take some risks on your portfolio, and then you're going to eat it. Or at least dynamically, you know, optimize, eat some, save some for tomorrow. But this is very different. And, the, and it's key that they don't have to eat the returns off their capital stock or make their own independent savings decisions. And you've seen, you know, last time, building up to this, that households are sharing a lot of risk with each other, and these informal village money markets are, are quite active. We called them a money market last time, so we've already been using that language. That's what this slide is saying. That's just a reminder of what we talked about last time. So data, it's monthly. I don't know what to call four villages grouped together in a tombone. So we kind of started adopting this South Africa language. I don't, I don't know whether I like it. We're calling them townships. Really, I just call plantation a township. Yeah. It's uh, sort of rural and maybe not that the best place to be. Yeah. So tombone is Thai for, you know, the fact that we pick four at random in this geographic area, but no one knows what a tombone is. So, uh, But clearly, townships distinguishes it from villages. It's four, four villages in the data anyway. You know all about the where they're located. Reminder that we started in August of 98. We're going to ignore the first four months, basically, and, uh, and, and uh, use the data from 1990 on. 1999, uh, we're still, we'll still, we're still out there. 
uh, at month 174. What we're going to use, and Chris and I just basically redid this in the last few weeks, um, we're going to use month 5 to 160, or basically 156 months or 13 full years of the data at the monthly level. For the 541 households who are basically not, have not dropped out, sort of the balanced panel. Now, about the townships, Matt, so how, what percentage of households have relatives living in the same village? Uh, it's a bit low, in Ch only half <laughs> in Chachung Sao. Uh, uh, three quarters in Lopuri, and Buriram is already up to the 80s, if not to the 90s. But if you go to the township level, you know, then 87 is the, really 88 is the lowest percent. In other words, almost every household has a relative, if not in their own village, then in a village nearby. So, you know, we stopped kind of looking at networks after this, and networks confuse people, rightly so, because who's in it and who isn't, and is there selection bias, and so on. So, you know, we just made it easy for ourselves to say, eh, they're all really related to each other anyway, so let's use the whole sample. But I'll show you what, we go back and check. This looks like risk and return in Village India. I mean, you can see the cultivation activities, livestock, fish, shrimp, uh, wage earning, and so on. Uh, you know, wage earning is a bit heavier in the Northeast than in Cha Chung Sao. Only, only Cha Chung Sao has uh, fish and shrimp. Sounds like a restaurant. I, you know, I've already told you, though, that's what you're eating in, when you buy shrimp at Costco. Um, and all the business livestock's pretty heavy in Lopuri, also Cha Chung Sao. Those are the dairy cattle. Uh, so that's just a quick reminder of the quote projects. My project is a cow, et cetera. <laughs> it's a cash cow. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, and here's some just reminder of, you know, descriptive statistics, males, females, education levels, some of this you've seen before, income levels, assets and liabilities, uh, and so on. Um, so we're going to use the total return and we're going to include financial assets. We're not going to separate. Um, by the way, it's a bit problematic to know what to do with a savings account. It's a financial asset, but on the other hand, maybe like inventory, it's kind of contributing to the business. And if we didn't have it in there, then people would ask, so we, it didn't make much difference. So we put in all the financial assets, actually subtracted off the debts too. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If you want to think about this as real rates of return, you would not be misled. Um, in real, real projects, real people, real assets. Okay, you know we constructed these financial accounts. This is problematic. We have to sort of subtract off the cost of labor, and when it's household labor, it's not priced. This is probably our single biggest problem. And when I show you residual rates of return in a minute, you'll see some of them are low. You know, we probably subtracted off too much. But it's very hard to know because we try to grab instruments and adjust, you know, but it's pretty, it's really kind of not terribly compelling. You'll see this again when we get to the labor paper. So we adjust the income, we divide by fixed assets. That, as you know, is rate of return on assets. We make it real. The data is nominal. It's all measured in Thai baht. So we deflate by Bank of Thailand regional uh, price, price changes. Um, this is uh, the table of the rates of return. Uh, 
mean standard deviation and the so-called Scharite, so I, I forgot to say it, but that thing I kept saying was sort of like a coefficient of variation. That's like the inverse Sharpe ratio. So you can add that to your vocabulary. Um, now, each household has a sample average. So you're going to have a mean, standard deviation, et cetera, those statistical moments for every single household. So you have a histogram in the population. So you can look at the median mean if you want, if it's not too confusing, or uh, you know the 25th and 75th quartiles of rates of return. Um, You know, some of them are high, many of them are not that high. But in any event, these are not adjusted at all. They're just the crude rates of return. If, um, okay, so now we gotta decide what to do with the risk-free rate. Uh, well, these are supposed to be real. So we're, we're basically gonna assume they have something like inventory that goes up with the price level, and there's nothing stochastic about it. So we're going to assume the real rate of return is zero. Uh, now again, if we're guessing wrong about this, we're going to be guessing wrong about the intercepts, because everything we do is you know, subtracting off zero. Uh, but anyway, that's what we do. The market return is the sort of the average uh, township rate of return, you know, and again, that's just looking at the income over all the households divided by all the assets. We're about to run a regression though, so we will take out the household's own contribution to the village average. It's like a leave out mean. So we don't, you know, bias it in the obvious way. Yes? Just to back up a second, inventory, what do we do here with depreciation? Depreciation is, is in here because depreciation is a, uh, a cost that we're subtracting off in the financial accounts. So that's our top left? Uh -huh. So the, these, these numbers are basically coming off of the income as in the income statement and the assets as in the balance sheet, which you've seen before, although it is true that we cover a lot of ground, so happy to remind you. Um, so how do we get the relationship of the household's rate of return to the village average? We run a regression. We run a regression of the households over all of its projects. Households return at day T, but you know there are lots of dates T with all those months. More on that in a second. Regressed against the village return at day T. Okay, so this beta is just literally the regression coefficient that we wanted, conveniently. Yes. So you're assuming this beta is constant over time for each household. Uh, we're gonna. Okay, so yeah, we're, there's several adjustments. I think it's on the next page, but anyway, so, so actually what we're gonna do is do five-year increments. Uh, you could just take one household over all the many you know, years and months and, uh, and ignore possible shifts in their portfolio. But like you're saying, that might be a bad idea, so we redid it as if you know, the household had returns on a portfolio from year one through five, then returns on a portfolio from year two through six, seven through eight, and so on, all the way through. And it turns out that's that idea, as many others, come from the finance literature. So that's what we're doing. Uh, the other adjustment I should have mentioned earlier, and I didn't, but you remember when we used a quadratic utility, 
it was A plus B times something, right? And there was no T on those things. So it was like the marginal utility of wealth, you know, just depends on wealth and it doesn't depend on anything else. But in many intertemporal models, uh, those things would be moving around. So we're, I'll tell you about that adjustment too. We actually did it all the different ways. So, but these are the key steps. We run the regression or regressions for each household. Um, and then uh, we get the beta for each household J. And we get the, the, uh, the average return either over all the years or over these five-year increments. And then we, we run this regression, essentially with this already coming from a previous regression using the panel, this thing is just a cross-sectional regression. There's no time date here. This is the average return. This is the extent to which the village, that household's returns are correlated with the village average. And we'll get expressions for lambda, alpha, and so on. And there are restrictions, although you no doubt can't remember, you know, seven and a half slides back, that, that this lambda ought to be equal to something like the expected market rate of return. But just take my word for it. We don't impose that restriction. So here's the first result. Beta is on the right-hand side, and it's being regressed against the household's mean rate of return. And Three of the four provinces is quite, uh, quite positive and significant. Uh, the only thing in this, you know, these are the regression coefficients, the lambdas basically, and this is the estimated constant. And, uh, you know, R squares, you know what it is, it's kind of worth noting. Buriram fails and has a very low R square. And Buriram is one of the places I've mentioned where the farmland got plowed over with roads and, you know, the town was being built up. So there arguably were a lot of changes in occupations. Um, we'll try to fix that. Yes? Um, so um, is this for one five-year period or is this like an average of the... This is actually with all of the treating each household multiple times. I think. Let me just see. No, it's not yet. So that's like the whole this thing. is the whole thing. We worried quite a bit about, you know, potential econometric biases and so on and so forth. Then we went back and read the classics in finance, Fama, French, you know, all these guys, and we're doing what they're doing, so we felt better. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Oh, we haven't, yeah, we sh I don't think we've looked for autocorrelation and stuff like that. The HH factor. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll check that. Yes, Hong. So do you think it's worth to just a test, to joint test the alpha J for each household, like the finance guys? Doing? We're about to show you the alpha. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, well, we'll see when I get there whether you have something different in mind. But, um, anyway, 
Oops, sorry. So if you want to visually see sort of a mean variance frontier, uh, you know, this, the beta is down here. That's kind of the risk factor, if you believe this model. And the expected returns are here, and you can see a pretty close fit. Now, this, you know, I've shown to the finance guys, you know, at lunches and things, and they're like, wow, because this, this is actually pretty good relative to New York financial markets. Um, <laughs> oh, it's an easy target. Okay. Uh, so, so far we are showing that, uh, just to repeat, uh, when someone has a high return, it's partly not talent. It's just that it's correlated with the, the village average. And, and it, it's high because you need to adjust for the risk. Now, we can do this at the village level, in which case nine of the 16 villages we're going to have this positive correlation that the theory says ought to be there. And when you go to the town, the, uh, we go to the network level, we have five out of nine networks. And, and I'll show you about the adjustments. To remind you, here's a kinship network. You know, 206 is married with 207 in some way, and 214 has all these. So, you know, connect, literally connect the dots. Here's a big dynasty down here. Here's a little dynasty there, another little dynasty there. So we went through all the villages and sort of, and they had to have enough data to do this. So we ended up with, uh, with networks. Now, some villages uh, have more than one, et cetera. Um, so of the nine with enough data, you know, we picking up the theory doing well here and not in some of the other ones. So as I said, we get go micro, go macro, zooming in and out. Um, there's a lot of explanation of the rate of return that has to do with the village average. This is villages. Uh, okay, so this has to do with changing projects, basically. So it's what I said. We use these sort of five-year intervals and redo it. Uh, and, and kind of reassuringly, Buriram pops back in there. Because Buriram was the place, for sure, that I know that they switched occupations quite a bit and moved from you know, lower to higher rates of return. So it's kind of reassuring, given the previous work, to see that this adjustment allows us to recover you know, something, although the R square is nothing to brag about. Um, but anyway. Now, another, another hard thing, easy and hard at the same time, is human capital. It's not physical capital. So as you know, a lot of these households have laborers, they're earning wages, and you say, well, where, what's that? The fruit of what tree is that? Well, the tree is human capital. Of course, you never really see that. You can write big H, and you have the notation for it, but what is it really? Unfortunately, we don't need the measure of the stock. We, all we need to do is measure the flow. So, you know, so basically, it's not quite right, but largely the, uh, the return on human capital are the wages these households are earning. And we will now put that in the equation as well. And, yep. And this is rather than something like skill and talent, we're saying people are getting different returns because they're somewhere all on this right. return frontier. So once we think of this model, what like how do we then respond to the big questions of the puzzles of you know heterogeneous returns? Like, do we know what Well we don't know yet, I haven't shown you. Maybe there's no puzzle. That's the point. People aren't adjusting. But, uh, but anyway, not to keep you in suspense, it, it is going to turn out that there is a residual, and then we can see what it's related to. Yeah. 
And I actually said it's wealthy females who have the high residual rate of return. So that's really the question of, given that they're all in that very nice regression line, which ones are where and why? And part of the answer might be is explained by. Well, there's part of it that we're not explaining. Even in the definition of the model, in the construction of the model, and another part that's outside the model altogether. What we're not doing very well is, you know, why household J is running project I and some other household is not. We're just acting like the social planner knew and efficiently allocated projects across households. So that part is sort of related to the talent thing, but we never see it. We're not, we're not able to, we can only look at the residual return, which actually ought to be zero if the model is true. Anyway, uh, so another adjustment that I've mentioned is that, you know, A plus BW thing, and you might want to have time subscripts. So, um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Here's the human capital thing. So now the rate of return is, has two factors, a la basically Fama French type thing. Okay, one is the physical capital and the other is human capital. And, uh, and we can figure it, try to get both betas. Another is this uh, problem with the varying shadow prices. Um, well, another way to say this, mu, you know, act like mu was a constant. Mu t is the value of resources at day t. When in the derivation, it was always today versus tomorrow, and it kind of got suppressed. But suppose a village has a run of bad luck, like Tatrung Sawa, those shrimp ponds going bad, you know, then they have, they have less and less income. So you would think mu t is going up because the marginal value, the shadow price is going up. So we really do need to adjust for that. But there again, there's a way to do it. It turns out that that, uh, that time varying stochastic discount factor is related to the consumption wealth ratio. And in turn, the log consumption wealth ratio depends on three factors, consumption, physical wealth, and, uh, and basically labor earnings. Um, you know, rather than getting bogged down in the details, I think intuitively, you could just think, well, you know, there's physical capital, so, you know, basically the um, consumption wealth ratio is kind of picking up uh, the degree to which they have wealth today relative to consumption. So that's kind of like an obvious argument to have in, the, in today's shadow price. And these things that determine the consumption wealth or the log consumption wealth ratio kind of look like the accounting variables that we've had before. You know, how much are you eating? Again, how much is your physical capital today? And then how much is your, is your, is your labor earnings? Okay, so that's kind of the spirit of it and again, do our homework and we can find this exact derivation in the literature. So this consumption asset ratio just looks like this. Um, so we, we find that in the data by regressing it onto the arguments that I just mentioned, consumption and so on, and then we substitute in that estimated value into the regression that already was adjusted for human capital. So now we just did a double adjustment. We put human capital in, the rate of return on human capital, and now we have extra beta terms that have to do with the covariance uh, of those physical and human capital returns with this. Um, so basically we're just interacting. We have levels of things and then we're interacting it with the rates of return. So we do that, we end up with this. It's a longer equation and we run it. And we're still getting you know, the beta on physical capital. It's quite hardy, it's quite robust. Um, 
human capital is in there sometimes, sometimes not, but at least putting it in doesn't harm this. In other words, you know, as I said, we do all the adjustments that we can and we're still getting, getting uh, the basic result back out. Uh, now you want to know about risk. Well, this is the equation we're running. So you know you can do a decomposition of variance. The total variance in returns is just the variance having to do with you know the regression times the variant, or basically this thing. This is the contribution of market risk to the variance of household J. And there's a residual here that we were just chatting about. Uh, so we estimate its variance. And so that's the contribution of idiosyncratic risk to the overall variance. So now we have this measure, finally. But note, note that it didn't just come from using the data. We used the structure of the model to back it out. And, uh, and that idiosyncratic part is large. Um, you know, at least half, and in many instances, more than quite substantially more than half of the risk is due to the idiosyncratic component rather than the aggregate. Now, you know, one word of caution. We still haven't rejected the model. No one in finance says there aren't idiosyncratic returns. The question is whether they're priced. If you believe in the capital asset model or the consumption-based, you know, risk-sharing model, then idiosyncratic returns can exist, but they're completely pooled. So, so this does, per se, does not reject the model, but when we, we now stick the variance, sigma, sigma j, into the benchmark model, and uh, we're still doing okay with aggregate risk, but, but here's the rejection, if you like. The idiosyncratic risk is positively associated with the expected rate of return and for all the households. Now, you know, this is the, uh, if you like, the disappointing part or the tension, you know, which is you go to all this work and, with a benchmark and it seems to be doing really well, but there are features of the data against which it's, uh, it's not, you know, it's not doing well. Um, so it's clear that it's not an entirely perfect market's world from the point of view of the rate of return of these assets. But is the glass half empty or half full? Because it's also true that a substantial amount of the rates of return had to do with market risk. And most development researchers would have ignored that market part, I think it's fair to say, even though it's kind of a natural corollary to risk sharing. Uh, so, uh, so let's go back to these alphas. Um, so Jensen talks about having portfolio managers who are somehow smarter or better than others and they have abnormal returns. I mean, I don't know, this is kind of hard for economists. It's like, well, you do so well, why don't everyone just go in there? You know, like, I never make money. I just don't, you know, I don't trust my instincts. But um, I'll tell you a story about Walmart. So one of my colleagues who was at Chicago, a sociologist, was in Arkansas, and he saw this, you know, big square flat building, and uh, in northern Arkansas and, you know, he sort of checked it out and said, well, this is a really novel way of doing business. Well, it turns out to be practically the first branch of Walmart and he bought stock. He did quite well, obviously. So. Anyway, so maybe some portfolio managers are better than others. Maybe some households are somehow better than others. And uh, we've now got a way of adjusting for, um, for all those uh, risk factors, both the idiosyncratic and the aggregate. Uh, by the way, you, you will be 
relieved a bit, maybe, to know that when we rank order the households by the unadjusted rates of return and the risk-adjusted rates of return, the ordering is largely preserved. But the orders of magnitude are not. The second point is it's not just completely downshifting the distribution after you subtract stuff off. The tails come in, so it has a different level of skewness. So it's, a, it's kind of a serious filter on the data, but some of the earlier results that poor households have high rates of return and reinvest in their own projects, we're going to rerun those, but we're pretty confident those kind of results don't go away, and I haven't misled you in the earlier lectures. Um, so finally, here is running these regressions where we have aggregate risk, also allow idiosyncratic risk, where we have the betas on you know, aggregate physical capital and, uh, and the coefficients on sigma. So the first two slides, I said households who are older take, less, take on less risk, which means basically both the idiosyncratic and aggregate risk factors are negative. You might be willing to tell a demographic story for that. You know? well, we don't really have it embedded in the model. It's more like a residual or behavioral thing at this point. Because these residuals aren't supposed to be there. Um, and here's basically the wealth. Again, negative. So um, poor people have higher correlation of their activities with the village average, and the residual have a higher residual variance. I'm going to, you know, come back to that. Poor people seem to be exposed to a lot of risk. However, if you take out both sources of risk and regress on demographics and all these things, you know, wealth finally goes positive, and also this is a dummy for male, so to speak, is, uh, is negative. So the, the female-headed ha households are, and the high-wealth households are the households with, with the highest sort of residual rates of return. Okay. So... Now what I, I don't have in front of me, unfortunately, we didn't quite get close enough, but you may remember that QJE paper from lecture one on volatility, you know, growth, finance, what's related, and we said, well, we got to look at sectors, we got to figure out how much each sector is contributing to overall change in value added, and there was some really cool decomposition. So we're running that on these Thai data. Uh, so we can see, you know, at the level of income, you know, how diversified are these households. It's similar but not identical to this CAPM type approach. And so far, at least, we're getting the same answer, that it's the relatively poor households who are specialized, and the things they specialize in have high volatility, and... Uh, and so on. So, so poor people seem to be exposed to, to risk, at least on the income side. Um, so here's uh, moving to Sweden. Um, more sort of standard uh, asset stuff, uh, which John Campbell and co-authors have done, called Down or Out. And, uh, and, the, and what they're trying to do is very similar. They're trying to look at household management uh, of financial affairs using measurement in this amazing Swedish data. Uh, Sweden is you know, a socialist country, largely, and they measure everything, and everyone has a common ID, and you know, your whole portfolio, labor supply, everything. So I've been collaborating a little bit with a Riksbank uh, 
largely influenced by, you know, this paper. Now, unfortunately, it takes us away from development. That's not my point. My point is the commonality. They're going to look at mean variance frontiers and see what households are doing. Like in particular, what are the poor people doing, or the rich ones? Um, the focus is a bit different, which is households can make mistakes. In other words, uh, let's just assume the model is right, and you know the mean variance frontier is what it is, and then see households in the interior who could get less variance or a higher mean if they only move to the frontier. And then they look by characteristics like education, wealth, and so on to see who is underdiversified. Those are the down people. And who's not participating, as in the stock market, those are the out people. And hence the title, very clever, down and out. And they measure the welfare costs of those deviations. As I said, they have amazing data. And here you can see uh, sort of how households manage their growth wealth in Sweden. Uh, this is the cash. Oh, look at that. Poor people have a lot of cash. I think cash just doesn't mean Swedish kroner. I think it also means uh, bank accounts. Um, but stocks, poor people don't hold stocks. Uh, mutual fund has this funny hunch. Now, it's interesting that this is real estate. So this is both financial as well as real. And on the household side, you know, there are some businesses here, actually, but most of these households are salaried, you know, employees. But they, they can hold durable goods and housing. If you take the physical housing wealth out of it, then the cash thing is still going down. Um, the mutual funds is largely flat, except at the very low and the high end. And then you see this, this stock. You know, it's it's the real it's the 90 percentile up are the people who have you know reasonably substantial holdings in the stocks. I ask myself these questions a lot in Thailand. You know, sort of maybe they shouldn't be investing in their own projects. Maybe they should be investing in um, Bangkok money market funds, safe funds. You know, we should be sort of looking at the whole mean variance frontier for these. And we are asking them now. We're actively involved. I was on the phone again last night. We're, we're about to be asking them a bunch of questions about are they aware of other assets and, you know. Do you, but, but in Sweden, the point that Campbell is going to make is um, you've got those categories and households can make mistakes by picking volatile assets, holding a concentrated portfolio, picking correlated. See the, the parallel here with what I was saying happens in, in the Thai villages in terms of relatively poor people uh, not being diversified and for some reason doing riskier things. Um, and there, or if, if you go in the stock market, you could pick your own stocks not a particularly clever thing to do. Um, uh, and, and this is the picture that makes the paper. Um, so here's the sort of mean variance frontier, standard deviation in means. Here's where they ought to be adjusting or not for international asset holdings. That's another, they do both. Uh, but they're basically saying, um, you know, small guys, in some sense, are unsophisticated and cautious. They're pretty far off the frontier, but they don't have kind of a lot to lose. Uh, and these, these richer guys up here, um, you know, they're more sophisticated. Their line is, quote, unquote, above this brown one, but, but their gap is huge. So uh, I'll spare you the details when they're, they're actually measuring the welfare loss, and some of these richer households are because they are not diversifying, actually have fairly substantial welfare losses. Now, you know, John 
Cisco's behavioral in this, and maybe rightly so. He's saying, you know, should we, you know, should we really be telling households in Brazil about uh, investing in whatever is bed spa? Can't remember the acronym. Or are they going to make mistakes and they're better off not knowing? There was a question. This isn't, this is welfare, this takes into account the marginal utility of wealth. Yeah, actually, I'm sparing you a lot. Oh, I should say, this is on the reading list, but I knew I wasn't going to have time to cover it in much detail, so I picked like six slides. But we'll, um, I'll post the whole paper. You don't, if you're interested, you don't necessarily want to or have time to read the whole paper. You might as well look at these lecture notes that I created previously. And the same thing for this paper which is Adriano's with Amir Sophie, Dynamic Risk Management. I've only got a few slides. I think I'm going to jump and show you something. Fly Southwest. So, so this guy's loading that airplane, that capital stock up with this variable input, the fuel. <laughs> they buy forward positions because the price of gasoline moves around a lot. So they, they basically buy forward, okay? They commit now to buy gasoline at a peg future price. Now what happens if the spot price is lower than that? It's like, oh darn, we should have waited. Actually, you could renege on that contract. And so what do they do with those things? You've got to post collateral against these, these forward gasoline hedges. Oh, where are we going with this? We're going to get to sort of thinking about something that Chris Udry was doing in Ghana, okay, which is, do you want to use your, your uh, scarce collateral to borrow and get more aircraft with potentially high rate of return, or do you want to use your scarce collateral and tie it up hedging against future, you know, states of the world S prime. And this paper is about how, in practice, this may not happen. Now, you know, when does it happen? Oh, where is it? It happens when the airline isn't doing very well. So if you think about relatively poor households, you know, it's like, Oh, they're behavioral. They're not buying uh, insurance. What's wrong with them? They're, they need it most. They've got the most marginal value. Well, no, not necessarily. They may have better use for their existing wealth. So this, we're getting again very explicitly now into obstacles. So when you start writing down model, you know, models with obstacles and barriers to trade, you can get you know, at this issue about borrowing to finance projects versus borrowing. And maybe, so maybe it's still possible that those relatively poor people who seem to be doing really risky things and aren't hedged against it, maybe there's, there's a reason for that. <laughs>